In this presentation, I'm going to show how you can solve quadratic inequalities, that is, inequalities that involve the square of the variable, in this case we'll call it x, on one or both sides of the inequality. I'm going to solve two inequalities, though they will be very similar. In fact, they will have the same expressions left and right, but one will be using a greater than symbol, while the other uses less than. Let's write them down now. I've called them A and B. We'll concentrate mainly on A. Once we've solved A, B will be very easy to solve and will be very quick. Here we go. When you're faced with inequalities of this kind, the first thing to do is to aim to have zero on one side of the inequality, usually the right-hand side. I'm therefore going to subtract 3x squared and 5x and 11 from both sides of the equation. That will certainly make zero on the right-hand side. Let's do that now. So on the left we have 4x squared, but we're subtracting 3x squared. We have a 2x, and we're subtracting 5x, and we have a 1, and we're subtracting 11. And that will leave nothing on the right-hand side. The inequality stays the same, though, greater than or equal to 0. We can simplify the left-hand side now by collecting terms. 4 take away 3x squared is just 1x squared. 2 take away 5x is negative 3x. And 1 subtract 11 is minus 10. And that will still be greater than or equal to 0. Well, that certainly looks a little bit simpler. The way to go now is to forget the greater than part just for the moment and concentrate on the equals part. That'll give us a quadratic equation. We should be familiar with how to solve those. Let's write that out now. Here it is. When you're faced with such an equation, you should first of all give some thought to whether it might factorize. If it's not at all obvious, then you'd resort to the quadratic uh, formula. In this case, though, I have chosen the numbers so that this factorizes. 10 can be thought of as 5 times 2. And certainly it's possible to get 3 from 5 and 2. So it suggests the factors might be x plus or minus 5 and x plus or minus 2. Let's start to write that down and then think about the signs. OK, there it is. Well, which way around will the signs be? They've certainly got to be opposite because we've got to have minus 10 as the product. So that's going to need minus 5 times 2, or minus 2 times 5. In order to make sure we get negative 3x, we're going to need minus 5 and plus 2 here. Let's put those in. There we are, that's now factorized. We can write down a solution, in fact two solutions, to this equation. Clearly x is 5, or negative 2. Let's write those now. Looking back at our original inequality, it was greater than or equal to. So actually we have now solved a part of that inequality. We've solved the equal to part. Those two expressions above are equal when x is 5 or negative 2. What else are those values telling us? Well, we've got the left-hand side expression x squared minus 3x minus 10. If we set y equals that expression and draw the graph, we should be expecting a parabola, and the parabola will pass through the points x equals 5 and x equals negative 2 on the x-axis. That's where y is 0. Let's do that on the next page. Here I've prepared the axes and marked on the points where x is 5 and negative 2 on the x-axis. I've also written down the expression y equals the left-hand side of our inequality, and remember that that inequality then had 0 on the right. Now, with 1x squared in that formula, we know the parabola must be the shape of a bowl. This sort of shape, in fact. Since we know the two x-axis crossings, it should be easy enough to just draw that parabola now. Let's have a go. There we are, that's what it looks like. Now let's cast our mind back to our inequality again. Let's just look back at the last page to remind ourselves. Now I've circled it in red. 
But remember now that we've called that left-hand side y on our graph. So we're looking for the places where y is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, where the graph is either above or on the x-axis. Let's go back and identify those places. Here's the graph again. And I've noted the two points where y is equal to zero. We already know those are going to be part of our solution. To finish solving the inequality, we need to look at where y is greater than zero. In other words, where y is above the x-axis. We can see that clearly enough on the graph. It's these positions here. What is it about those bits of the graph that we can say in terms of x? Well, the right-hand one is all the x's to the right of x equals 5. That is, x greater than 5. On the other side, the graph is above the axis for all the x's less than, that is to the left of, negative 2. So we can write that down as well. At this point, we've actually solved our inequality A. We found all the regions where the graph is above or on the x-axis. We could write those down in the following way to start with. We simply describe the two regions by saying that x is less than or possibly allowed to be equal to negative 2 or alternatively x is greater than or equal to 5. That's to the left or equal to negative 2 or to the right or equal to 5. There is a slightly more mathematical way of writing that though in terms of interval notation. If you think about it, that region to the left of negative 2 goes on indefinitely to the left. So it comes in from negative infinity. Similarly, to the right of 5, the x's continue forever to the right, to plus infinity. We're going to have to break this region into two intervals, the part to the left and the part to the right. We do it like this. First of all, we recognize that intervals are sets. So we write x belongs to in the usual way. We now have to write down the two intervals and we make what is called a union of sets. That's expressed with a u-shape symbol. We'll see it in a moment. Let's write down the first interval first though. It starts at negative infinity and progresses to negative 2. Sets with negative infinity are always open at that end so we use the curved bracket. At negative 2 though we're allowed to include the negative 2 in the interval. That makes it closed at the right-hand end, so we use a square bracket. OK, that's the first part of our interval. Now I said we have to make a union. That's a U symbol, but without any foot to the U. OK, well, finally we have to write down the other interval. That's to the right of 5. That starts at 5 and includes 5, so we have a square bracket with 5 next to it. And the interval progresses indefinitely to the right. That's plus infinity with an open bracket or curved bracket to indicate that. OK, that's the final form. We've got two versions of our solution. Each of those is equally acceptable. I've put boxes around them. But now remember we've got a part B to look at. Let's go back and look at part B. Now I've ringed it in green. It's exactly the same quadratic expressions, but this time the inequality is the other way around. It's less than. We could repeat all the algebra, but we don't really have to write it all out again. All we need to note is that we will change greater than or equal to to less than when we get to the end of our algebra. Let's go back to our graphs. Here's the graph again. I've erased the earlier solution because we now want to focus on the places where y is less than 0 rather than greater than or equal to 0. If y is less than 0, it must be underneath the x-axis. That's the region here. I hope you can see that that must be all the x-values between negative 2 and 5, but because this is now a strict inequality, we do not include negative 2 and 5. We could write this the following way. We start by saying negative 2 is less than x, so that's x to the right of negative 2, but then we must stop when we get to 5. So 5 is bigger than x, or, to put it another way, x is less than 5. We can include that in exactly the same line, by just writing less than 5 now. By writing it this way, 
we have incorporated both the negative 2 boundary and the 5 boundary in the single statement. You must be careful when you write sequential inequalities of this kind though. You must check that the thing on the left, the far left that is, the negative 2 in our case, is also less than the thing on the far right, which is 5. In our case that's fine, negative 2 is less than 5. But sometimes we see students writing inequalities in which the thing on the left is actually bigger than the thing on the right, even though all the inequalities are less than. That's a nonsensical statement. It would have to be written in a different way. To conclude this presentation, let's do what we did with part A and write this solution also in interval notation. This time it's easier. It's not a combination of two intervals, but just the single interval. Everything between negative 2 and 5, not including the endpoints. That's the open interval from negative 2 to 5. It's still a set, so we still write x belongs to, and then the interval. That concludes my presentation on this topic.